بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, now we'll start the second session uh, of uh, the meetings uh, this session will be mainly uh, about uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, we are uh, uh, very happy to have uh, a distinguished speaker uh, with us uh, today talking about inflammatory bowel disease uh, we'll start with uh, Professor uh, Remo Brincioni, he's the director of inflammatory bowel disease clinic at the University of Calgary and the director of gastroenterology uh, research. Uh, we know a name in inflammatory bowel disease uh, and uh, gastroenterology around the world. Uh, we are uh, very happy uh, to have him here today uh, talking uh, about inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Remo. Uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you. Bring this over here. So, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back in the kingdom. Uh, it's my very first visit here was, I think, four years ago. Uh, I'm amazed at how much uh, Riyadh has changed, and certainly in the area of IBD, uh, there are several centers here that um, I think. Uh, have set up the kingdom for very, very good care. Uh, what I've been asked to speak about today is monitoring inflammatory bowel disease, which I think, you know, with the evolution of all of the medications that we've had, this is probably equally as important is the way that we perceive and the way we've changed our monitoring techniques uh, in IBD. So most of you, if you've been to any conference in the last several years, have seen this figure from a publication from Benjamin Perriente, which really sort of outlines what our thoughts are uh, with respect to uh, IBD, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, in which uh, we believe that inflammation uh, is cyclical in nature, and with repeated bouts of inflammation, uh, you get uh, damage to the intestine, which leads to complications, such as the formation of uh, strictures, fistulas, and abscesses, which ultimately lead, lead to surgery. Uh, we've now come to recognize that uh, there's a very large disconnect between uh, symptoms and the presence or absence of inflammation, so just following symptoms really uh, isn't enough. Superimposed on this is this whole notion that there's a window of opportunity in which we can uh, enter with our best therapeutic strategies in order to uh, make a change in the natural history of disease. Once there is structural damage, even our best medications in 2016 will not uh, go all the way in changing the natural history of the disease. So this is really a, a diagram which shows what the management approaches are in 2016. There's really four cornerstones uh, of management. Um, there's this concept of predictors of disease course and response where we try to stratify patients. Um, we then think about treatment targets, which the next speaker will, uh, will talk about. Um, and then we talk about treatment algorithms. How do we treat the individual patient with the medications that we have? But inter intertwined in all of this has to be a strategy for monitoring the patients, how they're doing, when, uh, not only when they're sick and are they getting better, but probably most, more importantly is when they are asymptomatic, which I'll go over. I am going to briefly talk about treatment algorithms because the treatment algorithm that I'm going to show you in the next few slides is really more about a monitoring algorithm than a treatment algorithm. Why do these make sense? Um, if I look out in the audience, uh, most of you are experienced gastroenterologists. You see inflammatory bowel disease. Many of you may be working at the same hospital. Um, but even within a small area, a variation exists in the way we treat patients, especially uh, in therapeutics. If we look at any of the talks today, um, you have experts who are telling you that there must be an optimal way of treating patients, uh, not only if it's functional dyspepsia or hepatitis C, but also an inflammatory bowel disease. And when you look at algorithms in general, whether they're treatment algorithms or monitoring algorithms, what they do is they minimize treatment variance and they do lead to better outcomes, both in efficacy, safety, and usually at a lower cost. And they're, very, they're associated with better efficiency. 
So the algorithm that I'm going to talk to you about to be, before I go into some of the specifics on monitoring uh, is this randomized control trial that was recently published in The Lancet called the REACT trial. For many years what was happening is we would sit up at the podium and say, you know, patients should be treated early with combined immunosuppressive therapy. Um, the community gastroenterologist would say, well, you know what, we like to treat in step care. The patients that you're seeing in large IBD clinics or academic centers are different than ours. So you can only listen to that for long enough until you say, well, maybe we should do an experiment. And that's what REACT was. It was a cluster randomization trial. So instead of looking at patients per se, where we randomized patients to treatment A or treatment B, we randomized practices to either an early combined immunosuppressive algorithm or conventional treatment. So was the, communi the community gastroenterologist could do what they wanted or, the or those practices were randomized to the algorithm. Uh, this took place in Canada and in Belgium. And this is the algorithm, and I just want to sort of highlight one thing. Patients would enter into the algorithm when they started on glucocorticoids, either uh, prednisone or budesonide. But the most important thing was they were evaluated. They were monitored on an ongoing basis. The first monitoring point was at four weeks, asking, is the patient in steroid free remission? So we're talking about monitoring symptoms. And then as you can, sorry. Then, as you can see uh, in the algorithm, every three months the patients were reevaluated. How were they reevaluated when they were on the algorithm? It was a simple phone call from uh, the, the research coordinators at Robarts Research Institution asking uh, whether the patients were again in symptomatic remission off steroids. And if you weren't, you were escalated up the algorithm until you met that endpoint. On the other hand, if you were in the usual care or conventional therapy algorithm, the, ga the gastroenterologists and their practices would do whatever they wanted. They were not systematically monitoring patients. This is just to give you an idea of what happens in Canada uh, with patient demographics and GERT uh, in, in Belgium. These were not naive patients. You can see that 40% of the patients had already been exposed to anti-metabolites. Another third of patients were already on an anti-TNF coming into the study. And about uh, 12, 10 to 12% of patients were on, combined, uh, were on combination therapy. This is to sh show you what happened during the study, which ran over a period of two years. Initially, it was supposed to be a one-year trial. Then we ran it over two years. And you can see that the uptake of steroids in both the early combined immunosuppression in green and the conventional management is the same because that was the entry point. But if you look at the use of anti-metabolites, the use of anti-TNF, or the use of combination therapy, it was higher, obviously, in the early combined immunosuppression. Most of that took place early on in the first six months of therapy where, where patients and, their, and the practices were pushed to early combined immunosuppression. At the end of the two-year follow-up, it only accounted for approximately 11% difference. Remember, we've been focused on symptoms. So if we actually followed an algorithm of treatment and monitoring, Will we make a difference in symptoms be between the early combined immunosuppression and conventional therapy? And the answer is there was no difference, either at a year or two years. So technically, this is a negative study. Even if you ask the question often, are you in remission off steroids, or if you advance their therapy because you're asking the question, it doesn't make a difference in symptoms. So why is this so important, though? It's because of these findings. If you look at the end of two years for complications or first hospitalization, surgery or complication, this represents a 27% difference by simply introducing therapy early because you're asking the right questions. And if you look at this very carefully, if you look at the 12 month time point, one year in, there is no difference. What you're seeing is what's on the back end. So what you do early on and the decisions you make based on how you monitor patients and introduce therapies makes large differences down the road. The same thing for surgery. You can see that the absolute difference is only 3%, but what we're really talking about is population-based changes. And this represents a 31% reduction in surgical rates over a period of two years.
So it's really about intervening with the right drug at the right time. Uh, in this study, the, tr the time to treatment of the biologic was probably the most important predictor of patient success. In this study, we used, uh, 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 we used Humira, which decreased surgery, hospitalization, and complications. As opposed to what the community thought, if you introduced early combined therapy, there was no new uh, safety signal. And I showed you that if you looked only at symptoms, this was really not a great strategy. But it left a lot of unanswered questions. What would be the impact on early disease? As I already showed you, this was a mature patient population who had been exposed to multiple therapies. Would it be different if we, if we, if we looked at patients who are immune, naive to immunomodulators or TNF antagonists? And how about if we did make decisions based on objective parameters of inflammation rather than symptoms? So monitoring beyond symptoms. So, Another speaker will talk about the targets, and the targets have changed. So more recently, we published this uh, in the American Journal of Gastroenterology, which is a consensus statement on what the new treatment target should be. This was the STRIDE consensus under the auspices of the International Organization of IBD. And the consensus target is a combination of clinical remission or patient-reported outcomes and endoscopic remission. So really this concept of treating to endoscopic remission has come to nest in a consensus conference. Other things such as CRP, fecal calprotectin, are thought to be adjunct measures but are not really targets, they're surrogate markers for the target. And it's this, so what are some of the things that we can use in these monitoring algorithms? Certainly you can use standard blood work such as CBC, we can use biomarkers, radiology, endoscopy, and therapeutic drug monitoring. I'll talk about therapeutic drug monitoring in an upcoming talk. The thing that we need to think about, however, is what is the timing of doing these tests and the monitoring, and how do we track them? Unfortunately, if you look at tracking, we're not very good in our clinical practices. If you looked and audited a practice and you said, I'm doing CRPs to track my patients to see if they have active inflammation, only about a third of the CRPs that are abnormal are acted upon, meaning another test is ordered, a different test is ordered, or you're reacting and changing medications. So one of the important things when we talk about monitoring is if you're going to monitor, especially for subclinical disease, you need to be committed to actually act on anything that you're monitoring if it, it becomes abnormal. There's many reasons why we want to do this. It should improve treatment decisions so that patients do receive the right treatment at the right time. We want to optimize treatment quickly and we want to intensify treatment when it's appropriate. It should improve patient outcomes and potentially change the course of disease. So what we're looking for is a non-invasive marker. I told you that the target is endoscopy now from consensus, endoscopic remission, but obviously due to resources and patient acceptance, it could be difficult. So. We should have markers that are well correlated with intestinal inflammation and lesions. They should be able to predict flares. They should respond to therapy uh, if appropriate. They should be user friendly and affordable. If you look at what we have available, the two things that come out uh, that are practical in 2016 are both fecal calprotectin and CRP. They meet all of those criteria that I've just outlined as monitoring tools in our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. I'll go through this quickly. Most of you know what fecal calprotectin is, but if you look at all of the data that's available, you can see in Crohn's disease, there's a correlation with endoscopic activity. There's a correlation with endoscopic activity in ulcerative colitis. If you look at patients, it can predict relapse in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And in this study, which was the STORY study, the fecal, calprotectins, the fecal calprotectin rose approximately six months before the patients had a symptomatic relapse. And there's a whole host of studies that are shown on this slide that show that if you, whatever treatment you're using, that the fecal calprotectin will respond at a population level to treatment if the patient's symptoms are improving. And more recently, Emmy Lee Wright published this, which was a subgroup analysis of the POKER study, looking in the post-operative patients, where 
if you use a cutoff of uh, fecal calprotectin of greater than 100 micrograms per gram, it actually predicted uh, Rickard's lesions of I3 or I2 and greater. If you combine a CRP and a fecal calprotectin, um, it, can it can actually predict mucosal healing. And uh, we're just about in the midst of a publication uh, called the PREDICT study that's looking at not only fecal calprotectin and CRP, but other very routine laboratory parameters which will predict mucosal healing in your practices with a sensitivity and a specificity of around 85%. Um, this is just to give you an example of monitoring. This is a study of 178 patients who were in clinical remission, and they looked retrospectively at patients who had an elevated CRP, and then looked prospectively to see what happened to those patients. You can see that in the patients who had an elevated CRP over the next 800 days, 37% of those patients were hospitalized, compared to 7% of the patients who had a normal CRP. If you look at this data as well, if you had an elevated CRP, it was, in, it was associated with an increase in the Le Mans score or, or damage index in Crohn's disease. We can obviously use endoscopy. I think another speaker will talk about that, so I'll skip over the next few slides. We can use radiology. The problem with radiology is that CT is associated with significant radiation. Uh, depending on your jurisdiction, it's difficult to get uh, MR enterography. Uh, many of you know in Calgary we do a lot of small bowel ultrasound both through our radiology department uh, and within the clinic. Um, they all have their own merits. Uh, if you look at uh, the issues, obviously it's radiation exposure to CT. However, some of the newer CT scanners have very low radiation. So one of the things you should be aware of is what type of radiation your patients are getting depending on the CT scanner that you're using. Um, MRI probably is the most sensitive and specific in the right hands. It has signatures that show disease activity uh, as well as complex uh, or complications of the disease. Uh, it's obviously very good at, uh, at uh, detecting fistula and abscesses with all these different parameters. Uh, and you can see here on the right hand side uh, a very nice depiction of a stenosis and pre-stenotic dilatation with thickened bowel. And I won't go over ultrasound today. But if you look at the different modalities, whether it's ultrasound, CT, or MRI, um, the accuracy as far as the sensitivity and specificity is very similar. But you have to remember what your own radiologists are good at. The same thing for complications, sensitivity and specificity of all three modalities are, uh, are quite similar, uh, and for the diagnosis of stenosis. But once again, I think if you're looking at imaging, it does become a cornerstone of disease management, but it's it, and it is more important than endoscopic evaluation because it gives you more information, but you need to know your capabilities and you need to know and trust your own individual radiologist because they are not all created equal. So in the last three slides, I'll just tell you what I do in clinical practice. So if I have somebody who's flaring, uh, what do I do? I do standard blood work, a fecal calprotectin, a CRP, platelet count. We always do a baseline endoscopy or radiologic evaluation in these patients because if you're using surrogate markers, you want to anchor it to one of these tests. We do it before starting treatment and during treatment. And then after one month and at three, six, three to six month intervals until the patient is in remission. Once they are in remission, we continue to monitor the patients on an ongoing basis with fecal calprotectin, CRP, and a CBC. Um, again, when they're in confirmed remission, and we do this systematically every six months. In the future, we may be seeing some self-measurements, and, and several of the companies are looking at self-measuring of fecal calprotectin. This is our scheme of monitoring at the University of Calgary. You can see that it's very intense, but we're very committed to making treatment decisions based on this. So 
is it going to make a difference? Uh, this trial, which is monitoring based and, and, and changing therapy uh, based on objective monitoring called the COM trial, has been fully recruited. It was a trial that randomized 240 patients who started on steroids either to conventional monitoring with a CDAI or tight control, which was a CDAI and a high sensitivity CRP or fecal calprotectin, and then we were looking at mucosal healing. And then probably the sort of ultimate in monitoring is the REACT2 trial. So this is taking that algorithm that I outlined at the beginning of this talk and comparing it to serial colonoscopies to escalate therapy. So patients will either be randomized to the treatment algorithm or to the endoscopic algorithm and we will escalate therapies based on ongoing endoscopic activity. So this is really part setting up the treat to target concept that Mahmoud will talk about but there's several key do's and take home messages. You should measure and record baseline parameters to ensure that you can track your disease activity accurately. You should adopt appropriate monitoring for different patient situations and you should monitor regularly. You should m measure these mo monitoring parameters uh, accurately and precisely and what we want to do is achieve tight control. The days of relying on symptoms to monitor disease activity are, ant are over. Uh, you can assume that symptoms relate to active disease. We shouldn't be taking shortcuts in these patients. And if, you're, if you work in an area like I do, if you're doing endoscopy, please give me a good report and describe what you're seeing so I can actually follow them up in my practice. With that, I'll end. Thank you very much.